Hi. Good morning, Camille. How are you this morning? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Excellent. I'm doing okay. I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, but other than that, I'm doing well. So Me too. if there are any coughing fits, well, I'll just cut them out. So there you go. <laughs> the best part about podcasting is pretty much everything can be edited. That's awesome. Yeah. Ever mistakes we make, but we don't make mistakes. We have mistakes. Yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's why I All never right. learn anything because I never make mistakes. So there's nothing for me to learn from which to learn. It's a big problem. Were you not present when we did the episode on growth mindset? Yeah. Go back and listen to that joke. joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of all people. Today, we are going to talk about, actually, this is going to kick off a month of just talking about people, people in your business. So we're going to start today by just talking about why your team is underperforming. Welcome to The Belief Shift, the show that explores what you really need to know about building a successful small business. I'm your host, Camille Rapaz, small business coach and consultant who spent too much of her career working in corporate business performance. And I'm George Drapeau, your co-host and her brother. I'm a leader in the tech world, bringing my corporate perspective, but mostly my curiosity. Together, we're exploring beliefs about success and how to achieve it, but mostly we're bringing practical solutions so you and your business can thrive. So to kick it off, I thought, I wonder if George can remember your worst team experience ever, either as being a member of the team or even as a team leader where you were like, I don't know what is going on with this team I'm leading. Do you have any good examples? Yeah. When I was first thinking about this, I, this, I was thinking at first only about teams I led and I only have marvelous teams, so I didn't really have any problems <laughs> That's, That's exactly why true. I said as a yeah. team member, maybe, yeah, no, no. because yeah, you always love your teams. I've had problems with teams in the past and I can tell you about that. And then also I was thinking about teams that I'm a member of. I can think of an instance of a team that I was in where I loved the team, but was highly problematic. And there was one basic problem with that entire organization, really, that really caused us to held us back. And eventually... It got torn apart. And then I can think of three different examples of teams that I've led where an individual has caused problems with the team. And that leads to another class of problems. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. I do find a lot of these team problems, like they do sort of stem from systemically what's happening in the company, mm. especially yeah. in bigger companies. I remember years ago when I was consulting as part of a consulting firm. And I got sent into a client with a team that was just, they were just so negative. Like it was just unbelievably really just a big group of Debbie Downers and yeah. they fed off of each other's negativity. They just couldn't Oof. help themselves. It seemed like their managers also were just kind of like, I don't even know what to do anymore. Oh. And this was a cross-functional team. So that was people coming together from different departments. So there was something going on in that organization. Man, that was a wow. Rough I did not enjoy that. That yeah. uh, sounds yeah. horrible. So it's not great. And we need our teams to perform better. And if you're in a small business, bad team performance is really, really impactful. I mean, it's impactful no matter what, where you are. But yeah. as a small business, like we can't afford to have underperforming teams or underperforming individuals for that matter. So when I talk about this, I think about teams, it could be a team of one, it could be a team of several you know, so I'm just going to use this word, you know, team to sort of mean just any of the people that are working in your company. Okay. So we're going to talk about what causes teams to underperform. And just a spoiler alert, it's not because you're not providing enough pizza and beer. Just want you to know. <laughs> True. Haven't you seen leaders who think I just need to do something nice for my team and that will fix yeah. things? Yeah, absolutely. All the time. Yeah. And it doesn't. I mean, maybe it does temporarily. They're happy because they got food. Everybody's happy with food, but it doesn't last. So story about that. So a company I worked for was absorbed by IBM. We had a guy on my team who came from IBM to our company before we were acquired. And he said, I never want to go back. And he was talking about things that IBM had done in the past. Like they were steadily removing small benefits, like no more snacks in the break rooms that had, they used to have that had gone away. No more coffee for free in the break rooms, like really penurious stuff. And this is a case where like not pizza and beer, but those little things, when they go away, they matter. I was in an organization a long time ago before that, where they had had a budget 
where the exec admin would go to Costco every week and buy a bunch of stuff, hot pockets and other snacks and Cokes and stuff. And so the fridge was well stocked. And then they cut back on that budget and that went away and everybody was really upset. There were other things good about the team, but that, that was, it's not the thing. Absolutely. It's not the main thing, but it can be the straw that breaks the camel's back, or maybe it's a proxy indicator of other things seriously wrong. I think this actually makes my point even more which is when you do that kind of thing, to thinking it's the what's going to help my team be happier and perform better, that choice, I see so many companies make that choice knowing it's not going to be permanent. Well, let me say that differently. They're not thinking in the moment, like someday I might have to stop doing this because we mm-hmm. might not be able to sustain this level of you know, performance in the business in order to support this. So giving it is great, makes people feel good. It's not really, you know, making a difference in their performance in terms of leveling up. But when you take that stuff away, it's definitely tanking their motivation. Yeah, big time. Because they know it also represents things aren't going well in the company if they're taking this away from me. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's really important to think about when you're looking to improve team performance, those are not the go-tos. Because even if you can afford to go to it now, Someday you probably will have to take it away. And that's the worst feeling in the world because just because the business isn't performing, you don't necessarily want to take that out on your individual employees who, for the most part, a lot of them maybe don't even have any direct correlation. Like they're not the ones impacting sales, for example, if they're working yeah. in you know, IT. So yes. you have to be really thoughtful about this. Thank you for bringing that up, George, because I do think it's important to know, like it's nice to do nice things for your teams, but when you set a standard, and then you have to lower that standard, that's definitely going to take a hit to people's morale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was a fun side note. Let's get into the main <laughs> discussion here. Underperforming teams or individuals in your business, super stressful. Yeah. Oh, because oof. when it's happening, we know, and I, I see business, business owners do come to me with this, like, oh, what do I do? How do I have this conversation? Because it's confrontation. I have to have, to have this confrontational discussion with somebody who isn't doing the job at the level I need them to do it. Nobody wants to have that conversation. Yeah. Right. When you decided yeah. to be a business owner, you weren't thinking, because I also want to have difficult conversations. <laughs> that wasn't on your list of why you did it. Unless you're Vince McMahon running the I mean- WWE. That guy probably... <laughs> sought that out. <laughs> That's why this whole be. business is about fighting. <laughs> yeah, it could be. So unless you're Vince McMahon, you probably are not in it for that. If you are, I want to hear from you. So leave a voicemail if you're like, I totally got into this for that reason. But yeah, you didn't get into it for that. So no. So what we want to do is really do all of the things that are required to help your team perform well, because we don't want to have to have those confrontational conversations. You can't avoid them, but you can definitely minimize them. Right. So let's minimize those. Okay. So let's talk about the reasons why teams underperform. Can I put you on the hot seat, George? Yeah. What are your top three reasons just off the top of your head now, why you think teams underperform? Lack of trust is one reason. Toxics individuals, spreading toxicity, lack of clarity of purpose in the individual and the group level. There's just top three. Fantastic. You're spot on. I'm going to frame this up in a little bit of a different way, something that I use all the time when I talk about high-performance businesses, which is my high-performance framework. And it's just three elements to it. And we probably talked about this in a past episode where we talk about the framework, clarity, systems, and mindset. Yeah. These three big elements. There's a lot of stuff inside each of them. But if a business really thinks about just those three elements and improving them on a continuous basis it will level up the performance of your business. Yeah, absolutely. I like that too, because I mean, I just named off things. They all happen. I could have kept going, but I like this as a better framework for it. It's very clear and easy for addressing like kind of root cause areas. Why would you have to perform? Yeah, great. Yeah, and it gives you a way to really think about it. And the beauty of this framework is it applies to just your business in general, but also every single aspect of your business like this. So whenever you're yeah. thinking, I got to really assess what's going on and what's, what's broken in here, you can come at it from, oh, let me just look at how is clarity, systems, and mindset, and how are we doing in those three areas and any aspect of your business, whether it's marketing, team performance, financial management, like any piece of your business, you can just use these three to really see what's missing. Teacher question. Yes. Sir, I, in the back row. <laughs> 
I was just reading about Virginia Apgar earlier in the week and the Apgar score for assessing newborn babies. This is five point system she uses, which is really cool. Every doctor uses it when baby's born to, to come up with an instant score about baby's health. Anyway, so I was wondering, do you use this as kind of an APGAR score when you go in, you're hired in to assess somebody? Do you have assessment criteria that you use that kind of tells you, oh, wow, you guys are 40 out of 100 or whatever? <laughs> yes. Funny you should ask this. I, this I is do. not a setup. I, <laughs> this is not a setup. No, he doesn't even know that this is happening. I do use this when I go into businesses. So I have under each one of these elements, a set of questions. And so when I do a business ass assessment, when I first start working with the client and I, I am assessing their business, whether they're asking me specifically for that or not, because I can't figure out the space that I need to really coach them in without assessing what's going on. Yeah. So I use this with a set of questions under each one to help me assess like which area is really lacking for them and what do we want to focus on in our work together? So yeah, cool. Yes. And I am now developing it into a simple DIY. So a, if I wanted to just do a quick do it yourself, assess my business, I'm creating that now trying to get that together. So businesses can kind of get their own first look. It's not Sounds the same as getting an outside consultant's view. Like that's critically no. important. Somebody else has to, it's like trying to edit your own, you know, essay. It, you, yeah. like, you can't really do a great job. Somebody else looking at it. That's why, you know, when people write a book, somebody else always reviews and edits, like you need another set of eyes. So every business needs that. But this first look can really help you as a business owner, start to get a handle on some of these things. So yes, okay. that's what I do. That's cool. So let's just talk about applying it to a team. So okay. if we just focus on clarity, if your team is underperforming and you evaluate whether there's enough clarity or not, here's some of the things you're going to look for. Have I been clear about what their role is? And that might seem obvious, but clarity to you might not be the same as clarity to them. So you want to make sure for them that they're really clear about what their role is in your mm -hmm. company. And with that, have I set clear then expectations and ground rules for how we work together? Am I being mm -hmm. really clear about that? Have I even given them clarity from the big picture of what is the direction of this company? What's our vision mm -hmm. and our mission? Do I have clarity for them about their goals and the company's yeah. goals and how they fit into that? So the important thing about clarity is you might think, I've seen companies do this where they're like, oh, sure, we have a vision statement. Okay, how many people in your company actually know what it is or know what mm -hmm. it means? Like most of these things require some interpretation for people working in the company. You as the business owner, you're living and breathing in it. It's, oh. It comes natural to you. So you have to remember that people that come into your business, into working with you, they don't have that same perspective. So as I say all of these things, I find a lot of business owners think they're doing a good job with clarity but they're really not, it's really not translating to their employees as well as they thought it would be. So mm -hmm. it's worth digging into and asking questions of your teams, of your people working with you to make sure that they really do have an understanding in the way that you want them to about any of these things. Okay. Would you add anything to that? What am I missing? I was starting to think of other things that came to mind, but I think the things that are either subcategories of this, like outputs or services we deliver. If you think about your team, what other people can count on you from, I think it falls into one of these categories. It's not a different thing, you know? No, but that's good. I mean, I think even with like expanding the idea of the, your role versus someone else's role. Yeah. Where do they have maybe some touch points or overlap? How do you expect them to work together? Yes, exactly. I think it's what I'm thinking is how, one way of explaining my role. So we can do job descriptions are a great way of explaining a role. They put things on paper. And in addition to that, I also find it helpful to answer like, okay, when can somebody expect to call on me? And when, when should somebody not call on me? You know, a different way of talking about the role in terms of what I provide and what I what's outside of scope. But I think it's yeah. part of clarity here. That's all part of clarity. Yeah, I think so too. So what I wanted to think about some examples of what kinds of problems. So if there's not enough clarity in a business, not enough clarity for the team, what kinds of problems get created? Like what oh. do you see happens? I see we have a problem in the organization I'm in now where 
we have these different technical teams that all serve the same set of partner companies, but from slightly different angles. And that's never been clarified until recently, actually. I mean, it was 20 years in the company, it's never been clarified. So somebody running our partnership with big cloud service provider company needs some technical help. They don't know whether to go to my team or that peer's team or that peer's team because they're all technical and they talk with each other. And so they're paralyzed. They'll fall through the cracks or they'll ask the wrong questions of the wrong team and then they'll get a response. Like, That's not me, it's somebody else. Stuff like that, for example. I see people waste time on tasks that aren't necessary mm -hmm. because they don't have clarity of like the scope of what they should do. So an example would be, you know, this team is working on a specific project and they're looking at all the different options in terms of how they're going to approach it mm -hmm. and not knowing that leadership has already taken one of these options off the table. Yeah. They're like, actually, that one's no good anymore because we're out of time <laughs> to even explore it. And the team still has it in their plan to work on. And this could yeah. happen just to an individual. So you could have a single person working on some little project of their own for the company because those requirements or the scope or that like these things are changing all the time. Yeah. And you as the business owner know that's happening. If you're not constantly giving more clarity to people about how things are changing, they're still working in the old way. And they're wasting time on things that they shouldn't be because you haven't given them the updates. You haven't been clear about like, here's how things have changed. Now I want you to pivot in this direction. Making sure, I guess, clarity is also timely that you're doing it often mm, yeah. because things change so much. So it can just be mm -hmm. a huge time waster for people. This is where lots of efficiency gets lost just because people just aren't really clear about what's going on. Interesting. I see that. Yeah. So that's clarity. Let's talk about systems. Cool. Yeah. So when we talk about systems, systems and processes, and I mean both like the technology systems, but also just the system of work and business process. And here you could be looking at technology systems. So the tools that the company uses, mm -hmm. uh, you can be looking at the steps and business processes of doing any process in the company. Usually these are the ones that we're repeating over and over again. Mm -hmm. So are they well-established? so that they are helping to reduce the chaos and people aren't reinventing the wheel every week when they come to work and start this new task all over again. And they're not following a set of steps or guidelines. And are yeah. they actually clear? So this gets back to, well, I think that the process is clear, but maybe it's not clear to the people <laughs> who have to do the process. <laughs> yeah, You think it's clear because you know your business. Yeah, I You have to go that one step further. Um, there's also standards and guidelines. Like you've talked about guidebooks. This is where that comes mm -hmm. in. Are things well documented and are they accessible? I yeah. hear this often. Oh, where like, well, we wrote point. that in it somewhere. I know it's somewhere in that Google drive. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> well, it doesn't help if you wrote it down and nobody knows where it is. Yeah. You yeah. need a system that supports the systems. I've um, been guilty so of that. I'm right? not proud to say it, but I'm owning up here in group therapy. We we all have. We all have. I've done it too. I write something I'm like, oh no, I did that work. Where did I put it? Why am I not making it easy to access? Some other examples of systems could be, what are your systems of communication? What are your systems for accountability? Or what are your systems for emergencies? Oh, so, yeah. Especially if you're a company that really has to focus on quality and safety, you're probably automatically thinking about systems to support that. You can expand mm -hmm. that into other types of emergency situations in your business. And when I think about these systems, they are also a way of helping to improve on clarity. So for example, a business process, if you write that down, if you're clear about how you expect that process to go, you're also providing clarity. I expect if you do these steps, we'll get X outcome. We've talked about that before. Yeah, That's a really great way to help employees really clear expectations. This is what should happen in the work. Yeah. Anything you would add? in the systems bucket? I have examples of systems, but I wouldn't add anything categorically. I think these are really cool. Though the one thing it brought to mind is, I, was, I don't know why it was what you said about safety, but I thought about, yeah, people who are concerned with safety and have emergency protocols and safety protocols. I imagine that sign that says X number of days, it's been five days since our last accident. And then where my mind went was, if you have systems, it makes measurement easier because you have standards. So there's maybe something about the system that you set up that makes it very easy for you to score yourself 
or to evaluate how safe you are. There's a nice connection there. And I like measurement. I like, you know, metrics. And so that that's just what came to mind when you said that. Yeah. You know, every time we do an episode, I think of another episode that we need to do, which I love. <laughs> so note to self, we need to do an episode on the role of clarity systems and mindset in improvement. Okay. That's where that leads to. That's the reason you measure so you can improve. No. So yeah, you're spot on. That's exactly it. So when you don't have good systems, what kind of problems have you seen, George? Many times in my career, I've managed an understaffed group. What happens to my teams that are understaffed is when things are unclear, a couple things happen. You end up having single points of failure because we haven't defined who does what, and then that makes it harder to have somebody come and be a stand-in. So if something happens to that person, then, ah, we don't know what to do. There's no clear definition for who can step in. I can't even really ask, hey, can you take on somebody's role they're out sick? Like, what do they do? Well, I have to kind of say, oh, I don't know. And they kind of do stuff. That's a big problem. Also, things just go slower because we don't have a clear process for basic stuff if we're understaffed. And so everybody's just kind of winging it <laughs> or being a cowboy about it. And that gets stuff done, but it's not very not very efficient. You can't move very fast that way. That's a really good example that when talking about just being able to have backup, because I think for small businesses, that's the main reason they should do it. I mean, you're small, one person's out, that's a big percentage of work in your small business that yeah. isn't getting covered. If nobody knows how to you know, pick things up and just, you're, even if it's just covering things for half a day, and just having just some basics that you can take care of. So I think that's a really important reason. This gets back to the why we tell people to write it down. Yeah. Like any of these fast food places like Subway or stuff where they have instructions on how to build any particular kind of sandwich. I mean, it's better if somebody's doing it for a while. But if you have somebody who has to go and do it, like that book has the all the sandwich recipes just follow that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So if we need to write down how to make a sandwich, imagine all the stuff in your business that's way more complicated than that that you need to write down. <laughs> yeah. Just now I want things. a sandwich. I know, me too. Sandwich break. So the, the other thing I didn't mention that I guess I want to bring up now is when we think hmm. about systems, there's another aspect to this, which is systems thinking. And systems thinking kind of starts drifting into mindset, but systems thinking is important for a team as well, because what you want them to be thinking is not just very myopically about their role in their work, but mm -hmm. you want them to think from a systems perspective, how it connects to and impacts and is impacted by other roles in the company. Okay. Yeah. The more they have clarity about that the better they're going to be able to perform because they will make better decisions based on, oh, if I do this, I know it's going to affect someone else down the road in this specific way. Okay. So I either can reach out to them or I can change what I'm going to do because I know it's going to have a negative impact. That can be one of the things that's disrupting a team is like somebody's just working away, doing their thing, but they're not really thinking outside of their own role. And so it's disrupting other parts of the business. Yeah. So I think that's an important aspect too, to look to as your team yeah. is underperforming, is there just a lack of systems thinking across the team? And this is very common, by the way, I find a lot of times people, they just show up, I just want to do my job and then I'm out and they're not thinking more broadly about how is this impacting? And in a small business, I think you really do need people that are more systems thinkers because it's this really, you know, tight knit system. There's just a yeah. few people running this whole thing and you've all got to be pretty aware of how you're affecting each other. It's like, if there's only three of us in this little lifeboat, we need to make sure we're balancing our weight and aware of where we all are so we don't tip the oh, boat over. That's so cool. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's systems. Last one is mindset. Mm. So does your team have the right priorities? Are they excited about the work? Are they getting opportunities to learn and to grow and feel fulfilled? Are you giving them consistent feedback and coaching? Do they understand and align with the values and the culture of the company? So those are the things I think of with sort of team mindset. And sometimes when we talk about mindset, we also talk about leadership. I think of leadership as not a title, but as a role you choose to take on. And I think everybody in a company should do some level of leadership. And so are they also coming at their work from that perspective, feeling some, some ownership and confidence in being able to be a leader in the scope of their work? 
What would you add? I completely agree with that. As you're talking, I'm trying to think, if I have not really dealt with this concept before, I was just wondering, am I going to confuse mindset for learning how to have a more positive attitude? But that's not it. That's not only it. It's a lot more than that. A lot more about how we think of things. Like the belief shifts. Each one of them can change our mindset in a very useful way. Questioning versus self-critique, for example, is a huge change in mindset. It can change everything. Yeah, that's, you know, taps back into when we've talked about learning mindset. Are they coming at their work from that perspective? And are you giving them opportunities for that? So mindset, I find to be a bit challenging because what we often want is to hire somebody that just has the right mindset and will plug in. Mm -hmm, of course. But what we forget is that even if that happens, we as the leader of the business and the owner of the business we have a job to do in making sure that, how do I want to say it? Making sure that the mindset stays strong and aligned to the work that we have for them. So that means even if they come in with the learning mindset, you could easily undermine that mm. by just not tending to it. It's like all of this stuff needs care and feeding. Yeah. So if you feel like, yeah. well, I hired them and they seem great, but they're just kind of like falling flat now. It might be because you're not doing enough as a leader to really support that. Maybe you're not giving them enough opportunities to learn. Maybe they're being micromanaged. And so they don't feel like they have enough, you know, control over their work. Maybe they're, you've just kind of left them out on their own and they seem to be doing great. But even people who like lots of autonomy, they need feedback. They need yeah. to know, am I on track? Am I not on track? Am I delivering what you want me to or not? Am I doing it in the way you want me to do it? So you have to make sure you're making these connections and helping to keep their mindset engaged in the work. And yes. I think it's easy to forget or to just think that's their job to stay focused on their work. It is, but it's not their job alone. It is also your job to ensure that that happens as a leader or business owner. Mm -hmm. I agree. So this can be a tricky place to look into, but I think it's probably one of the more meaningful ones because this is where you yeah. have the real conversations about what matter to people, which is really what starts to level up their performance. So yeah. if you've got a team, so think about George, what are some examples you can think of where what kinds of problems show up if your team, it doesn't have the right mindset? Oh yeah. So the biggest, the first thing that comes to my mind is morale problems. Let me make this specific. So People will have lower morale, which has all kinds of other bad effects that leads to poor performance and people, higher turnover, all these things that happen. And I want to make a distinction between high morale and happiness. I think if you have high morale, you're probably going to be happy, but it's kind of the same distinction between liking your team and having a solid relationship with your team. You don't have to like them, have a great working relationship. You don't have to be happy necessarily to have high morale and so one thing that I see over and over again is when an individual doesn't see the understand and align with the values and culture of the company, if they're a good actor, if they have a good heart, then they will start to feel outcast and alone. And they're trying, they don't see their connections. So they just feel bad. Their, their morale goes down. If they're a bad actor or egotistical or something, they will start acting more aggressively and doing things on their own, not caring about the rest. And they become more toxic. And you have to get those people back on the program or get rid of them. You know, I think it goes two different ways, depending on the personality. Yeah. And I think that even then speaks to how that makes this even a little more tricky to assess because there's not just one way that they're going to act if this is happening. There could be different ways that they might respond in that scenario. And you have to be attending to that. I like that you called out the good versus bad actor way of responding to this, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes I see people, you brought up the idea of whether I like, you know, liking somebody on your team mm -hmm. or somebody being likable. Mm -hmm. And I have definitely seen a problem where somebody is really well liked, but they're not a good performer. And that's sort of yeah. the worst scenario. Oh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, because you're like, I really like you, man, but oh, you're killing me. Like, I just, how do I get, <laughs> how do I get you to just do this other work? And, and other people oh. don't want to give them feedback like that. Or maybe the whole team likes them. So you're like, oh, how am I going to, you know, I don't want to come down on them because everybody likes this person. 
that's a really rough spot to be in, but you can't let it slide. You cannot. No, you can't. You can't. Liking somebody is not a good enough reason to keep them around. Tell you a story about that. Yeah. So one time, and this was the most extreme form of ad- addressing it. I had to lay off some people. And within this one particular team, it was a pretty high performing team. One of the guys on the team was the sweetest guy, very hard worker, tried to be diligent, didn't have great attention to detail in a job where he really should have. And he had been there for years and nobody had really ever told him about these problems because he was just so darn nice and really wanted to do a great job all the time. Everybody loved this guy, everybody. And nobody had given that feedback. When it came time for layoffs, we didn't lay him off because of performance, but his role was easy to excise and I had to be the one doing it. I had to do it. And so I decided to man up and talk with him, tell him straightforward, you know, your position has been eliminated, all, all that talk, but as succinctly as possible. And I also told him, look, here's what I would recommend you would work on. These are areas that try to give him a little bit of performance help. I didn't really have much interaction with him before this. He took it amazingly well, not just because he was being sweet and he went home and cried, but he had never had that kind of straight talk with them before and getting it. He was a sort of grown up. He can handle it. We, most of us can handle this stuff. And he handled it really well. He was great. No problems. He understood exactly what was going on. And he went merrily on his way to his new job. What I learned from that was more often than not, when you give people direct talk, direct feedback, they prefer that. You know, think about being broken up. Somebody's breaking up with you and they just tell you, look, we're done versus kind of dancing around it. It's the worst conversation where you know right. something bad's coming to like, we just say it, we just say it. Or the, it's not you, it's me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then take, take 10 minutes to tell me about that. And it probably was something about me, but I guess I'm never going to know. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, thinking about how you would want to be treated in any of those situations, if the you know tables were turned, that's mm-hmm. one way I like to think about it is, well, what would I want? Well, if I would want as clear an understanding about my part in this as I can so that I can go improve next time. I know what to do next. So yeah, I think that's really important too. And just thinking about that mindset, but boy, it's heartbreaking when people are super nice and you have to do that to them but it happens. So those are the three areas to focus on clarity systems and mindset. There is a fourth. Oh, there is a fourth reason why your team might be underperforming. You just might've made a bad hire. Yeah. You just might've made a mistake. Now I find often that people can go to this as the reason first. And I think that's a mistake. I don't think you should go there first. No, I think you should look at these other things first and say, well, have I given them what they need to be successful? Because that is your job as the business owner, as a leader, your job is I need to give people what they need to be successful. I don't just create a job, stick a person in it and hope that all goes well. That's just not how it works. No. So this is the last place you should look. But if you've done all those other, if you're confident, I'm, I'm doing a good job with clarity systems and mindset with my people. And this one person's just still missing the mark. If you've given them feedback, making sure that they understand what their expectations are and they're still not meeting them, then you probably just made a bad hire. And then you should move swiftly to replace them. Because also those bad apples, they're horrible to keep around. That's true. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. true. And speaking of hiring, we're going to talk about that in our next episode. So if you're like, yes. well, how do I make sure I don't hire badly? Oh, you we're going to help you. you- Yeah, you can minimize that. I mean, I think everybody ends up having a bad hire at some point or another, which is also really useful. Like those bad hires. Boy, do you learn a lot from that? Yeah, Don't make those mistakes again. So in the next episode, we will talk about how you can do a better job with hiring the right people. Awesome. Come back for that. But for now, this is all I've got talking about why your team underperforms. The good and the bad news of it is the ultimate cause of a poor performing team. It's pretty much you as the business owner. (laughs) The good news is that means you can fix it. I mean, the bad news is you're like, well, it's my problem to fix. So (laughs) there's a little yin and yang there. Cool. So make sure you're just providing the clarity. You're setting them up with the right systems. You're being clear about that. They've got an established mindset and, you know, stay tuned next time for how to hire. Well, if you consistently work on these things, your team will level up. 
Um, I know from experience, and I know you do too. I do. Any last words, George? No, this is great. I really like this framework, really. It's not hard to follow, makes it easy for you to identify where you have sources of underperforming teams. This is great. I like to keep things simple, make it really easy for people to just focus on these three things. So I hope that's helpful for everybody. If you have thoughts, questions, other things you want us to address, either about team performance or, you know, other business things, leave us a voicemail at the We're lonely. Please leave us a voicemail. We would love to hear from you. Somebody leave (laughs) us a voicemail. (laughs) <laughs> and also please do leave us a review on apple podcasts did mm. you see our mom's message that she didn't want to leave us a review because she thought she was going to be too glowy that's very sweet of her i know it was very sweet leave a I review mom her. yep leave it's a okay. review mom you don't have to tell people that you're our mom yeah go read some of those other reviews there's some pretty good ones we would love to have you leave us a review so we can get this podcast into some more ears but in the please meantime do. We're going to check out of this episode and we'll be back in your ears next week. See you next week, everybody. 